Hello, everyone. This is Sean from the Soccer Nostalgia blog. I have the pleasure to interview Irish freelance writer, historian, and broadcaster, Mr. John O'Carroll. Mr. O'Carroll has appeared multiple times on a podcast discussing the history of the Republic of Ireland national team. This interview is separate from the podcast series. This interview, this video interview will serve as a companion piece uh, to a written blog presentation on Republic of Ireland's South American tour of 1982. Hello, John. Always a pleasure. Yeah. All, hello, Shahan. Always a pleasure to uh, speak with you as well. Thank you. Now, in our podcast with you in the past, um, as well as in our written blog interviews, we have mentioned Republic of Ireland's 1982 tour of South America a number of times. Yeah. Let's try to get more in depth. Uh, even before we discuss the world events that affected it, was this ever a popular tour? Well, the background to it was that, you see, as we all know, Ireland narrowly failed to qualify for the 1982 World Cup. Uh, they had been in an extremely tough qualifying group it was uh, Belgium, uh, the, the Netherlands and France. Uh, they only missed out on qualifying by goal difference. Uh, hindered in no small way by some uh, shocking refereeing decisions in in the away games against uh, Belgium and France. So seeing that Ireland went so close to qualifying but did not actually qualify, the Football Association of Ireland thought it would be a nice consolation prize uh, for the Irish squad if a tour of South America could be organised. Now, uh, the FAI had uh, undertaken South American tours in the past. Uh, they undertook one in 1974, uh, prior to the 1974 World Cup, where they played a number of games against uh, South American countries that would have qualified uh, for the World Cup. So these tours in the past uh, were somewhat lucrative for the FAI. And it was said that uh, this 1982 tour would have been worth 50,000 Irish puns, uh, which which really would be the equivalent of 50,000 uh, pounds sterling, which 40 years ago in 1982 was quite uh, a lot of money. So... Um, the idea was embraced by a lot of the by a lot of the Irish players because a tour in South America would have been seen as a novelty, and then factor in the the fact that they would be playing the likes of Brazil and Argentina, um, in such places as the Maracanã and Buenos Aires, and they also had uh, matches lined up against uh, Uruguay and Chile. Uh, the original plan was to have a four game tour against uh, matches against Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay and Chile. So it was quite appealing. But uh, as we will see, Shahan, uh, World Defence, uh, you, you know, took a hand and uh, they played, you know, a prominent part in the in the debacle which followed. Yes. So let's talk about it. Can you explain how the Falklands War in the spring of 1982 had a direct bearing on this tour? Well, first of all, many Irish players held British passports. So that was obviously going to be a stumbling block because when uh, Argentina uh, commenced hostilities uh, against the British, uh, anybody uh, with a British passport uh, would have been uh, fueled with suspicion for any anybody that is uh, entering Argentina. So many Irish players held British passports, which was a difficulty in itself. Now, some of them had Irish passports as well. Uh, the Irish gov when the Falklands War broke out, the Irish government agreed with a directive from the EEC, which is now the European Union, to impose trade sanctions on Argentina for one month. And Britain had requested that the EEC, uh, you know, assist them uh, in their uh, conflict against Argentina by imposing sanctions on Argentina. So a resolution was passed. Uh, at EU level, uh, it was in the EEC, of course, uh, the European Economic Community, to impose trade sanctions on Argentina for a month. And the idea behind this was that, you know, by imposing sanctions for a month, 
uh, negotiate, it, it, it would hopefully uh, persuade Argentina to go to the negotiating table uh, with Britain and, you know, seek uh, a peaceful resolution uh, through dialogue. So, at any rate, in 1982, Shahan, relations between Ireland and Britain were difficult, uh, apart from the Falklands War, because, as you know, uh, there was continuing unrest taking place in Northern Ireland, and there was constant uh, disagreements in 1982 over farming prices. Uh, in, in other words, uh, prices for uh, goods, you know, uh, for, uh, agricultural goods, which were ex- exchanged between uh, Ireland and Britain. Uh, and in the middle of April, an Irish fishing trawler was ac- accidentally sunk by a British submarine in the Irish Sea. Um, I think what happened was it it, it, it was a tragic as- accident as much as anything. Um, an Irish fishing trawler was out in the Irish Sea, uh, you know, doing its work, uh, capturing fish, and uh, a British submarine crossed its waters, and the submarine uh, apparently got caught in the nets of the fishing trawler. So the submarine, anyway, um, I suppose thinking it was under attack, whatever, uh, pulled down the fishing trawler with it and the fishing trawler sunk. So that uh, did not help uh, Irish-British relations. Um, So then uh, we fast forward to May and when the Falklands War had begun, and as you know, on the 2nd of May, the Belgrano, which was an Argentinian uh, warship, was sunk by the British even though the Belgrano was outside uh, an exclusion zone. Uh, so uh, this attack on the Belgrano was seen by many uh, as being somewhat unjustified. And as a result of this, the Irish government fought it to lift the sanctions on Argentina uh, despite British objections. And in actual fact, as, uh, as, as the month of May went on, uh, later in the month, Ireland and Italy uh, you know, reopened uh, trade trade with Argentina, and this did not go down very well with the British. So, I mean, all in all, Shahan, relations between Ireland and Britain uh, were difficult as it was even at that stage. And of course, the Falklands War and trying to re- trying to get Irish players released uh, to play uh, in Argentina was was going to be uh, 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 another headache for the FAI. Yes. And the FAI secretary, uh, Peter O'Driscoll, had uh, pug- publicly declared that uh, the war has nothing to do with us. We're neutral. So I'm That's sure that didn't point. help either. Yeah, it, Absolutely not. And uh, uh, Peter O'Driscoll had, you know, kind of at this stage, you, you could make the assumption that maybe he was somewhat out of touch with... Uh, you know, the political situation because uh, when the tour of Argentina uh, was first or when the Falklands War broke out, I should say, um, he his uh, own hand uh, said to Pedro Driscoll that, you know, it was it was going to be difficult for a game against Argentina to take place, you know, what with the conflict that was going on between Argentina and Britain. And Pedro Driscoll uh, apparently replied to own hand, he said, uh, you are a football manager, not a politician. So he left it over to one hand to uh, try and uh, uh, assemble a squad uh, yes. for, for this tour. Uh, yeah, so uh, Ireland manager Owen Hand uh, had felt that it was logical that English clubs would refuse to release their players. He was nevertheless, as you mentioned, tasked by his superiors to make pleas with the clubs to release the players. What was that process like? Hmm. It was difficult, and needless to say, because uh, when the war broke out with Argentina, uh, in Britain, or between Argentina and Britain, I should say, uh, Argentina and Argentinians in general were regarded by the British as personas non grata. So, uh, to sum up, anyway, all English league managers refused point blank to release players. Um, I think the, uh, the, the stumbling block at this stage was that I think at this stage, Shahan, even though I know hindsight, you know, is a great thing. If the match against Argentina had been pulled uh, there and then, uh, English clubs may have released their players because I don't think the, the the clubs or the club managers had difficulty with 
with their Irish players, you know, playing matches in South America, uh, as long as they did not uh, play Argentina or indeed enter Argentinian soil. And that was the major stumbling block. But as I said, Padre O'Driscoll took the view that Ireland was neutral. And because Ireland was neutral, that should have zero uh, impact, you know, on a match against Argentina going ahead. Or it should also have zero impact on British clubs re- releasing their Irish players. So uh, there was uh, that was the overriding sentiment. So as I said, uh, all English league managers refused point blank to release players. In, in actual fact, um, Ron Atkinson actually uh, told, uh, gave his views on the matter to one hand in rather colourful language, it's <laughs> according to one hand in his autobiography. So um, I suppose then we'd, we'd kind of maybe look at Liam Brady, because as we know, Liam Brady was playing in Italy at this stage. Uh, he was playing with Juventus. Uh, they were coming to the end of the Italian league season. He was about to win the, the Scudetto with him. And uh, he knew by this stage that he was going to be leaving Juventus at the end of that season. So, I mean, it was important for him that he got his, you know, club future in Italy sorted out. And in addition to that, at this time as well, uh, his wife was expecting a baby. So, I mean, he did have, you know, he did have a lot of, uh, you know, personal matters to uh, sort out. But... The one big draw for Liam Brady uh, when the tour was announced was the was the opportunity, as he believed, of playing Brazil in the Maracanã. So that uh, kind of you know persuaded him to um, go on the tour. But as we will see, you know the matches or, or the, the the match schedule uh, went went haywire uh, pretty quickly indeed. Yes, and. Explain the pressure from politicians that eventually forced uh, Peter O'Driscoll to finally cancel the match versus Argentina. Yeah, well, well, by the by the second week in May, uh, as as you know, the Falklands War was in full swing, and it was obvious at this stage that British clubs were not going to release their players for the game against Argentina. So, uh, a week before the match. Uh, the match against Argentina was uh, originally scheduled for the 19th of May. So a week beforehand, round about the 11th of May or so, the FAI withdrew from the Argentina game, believing that by doing this, British clubs would have no issue with Ireland playing other countries. And Honduras, who also had qualified for, for the World Cup, they were lined up uh, as a replacement for Argentina. Because the FAI at this stage were quite cash strapped. So uh, they were desperate to get as much of their promised uh, 50,000 Irish punts. Uh, they were desperate to get as much of that as they could. So on the 18th of May, then Ireland and Italy, as I said already, reopened trade with Argentina, and this was negatively regarded in the English media. So uh, as I said, British clubs are not going to release their players. So the FAI thought then that by uh, scrapping the Argentina match, uh, you know, this would have the desired effect. But by the time the Argentina match was scrapped, uh, which would have been the Olympic May, a lot of the Irish Irish players at British clubs had already committed to end-the-season tours with their clubs at this stage. And because of that, they were go- the Irish players were going to be unavailable uh, for the South America or what was left of the South American tour anyway. And on top of that as well, Shahan, uh, the English League season uh, in, in England ran somewhat late and Tottenham were playing Queen's Park Rangers uh, in the FA Cup final on the 22nd of May. So uh, naturally enough, that was going to rule out the Tottenham players of Chris Houston and Tony Galvin. And the FA Cup final, as you know, subsequently went to a replay, which meant that the the English season wasn't concluded until the 27th of May, by which time the South American tour would would, would be almost complete. So, um, as, a, uh, as a result of that, uh, Ireland ended up uh, going on the South American tour, uh, virtually with uh, a makeshift squad, uh, uh, shorn of virtually all their uh, English First Division players, with, with one or two exceptions, maybe from... 
you know, kind of lower clubs that or lower first division clubs that did not have uh, in the season tours organized. So, and uh, in the end, I believe Owen Hand was only able to pick 15 players. We should also men- mention that he was further hampered because the Ireland League 11 were also touring New Zealand around this time. So that was uh, one more stumbling block to call up uh, potential replacements. And uh, in the end, I think the only experienced players were like Brady, as you mentioned, Mick Martin, Jerry Ryan, and Jerry Daly, basically. And uh, uh, there's a story that uh, Chris Hutton received a message at Heathrow from FAI headquarters that he was not required to travel. Is there any truth to that? Like at the last minute, uh, that, told- yeah, yeah, that that's correct, Shahan. Because um, there was unfortunately, uh, the, you know, the FBI, as as we know, was so much amateurs in their preparation. So, uh, um, you know, Chris Houston received a message at the last moment saying that he wasn't required to travel. But uh, at any rate, you see, as I said, you know, the FA Cup final was. Uh, down for decision on the 22nd of May. That went to a replay five days later. So in our likelihood, uh, even if Chris Houston had had been had been cleared to travel, he would have he would have only played in the final game of the tour, which was uh, scheduled for the 30th of May. But you mentioned there about you were asking there about the team that you you know on hand assembled and yeah, you mentioned a few English league players. Now uh, Kevin O'Callaghan also went. He was with Ipswich Town at this stage. And there was also uh, a, a, a first call up for uh, a, um, the Everton defender Mike Walsh. Uh, Mike Walsh also he he had played with Blackpool, and I think he may have played with with Barry as well, or or, or 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 he would have had a brief spell also I think with Manchester City. But at this stage anyway, uh, Owen Hand was desperate for players. So anybody with uh, any semblance of Irish ancestry and who was not going on an in the season tour with their clubs. Uh, were, were were drafted into the squad, so that was the reason uh, Mike Walsh was um, called up. Now, at this time as well, on hand, in addition to managing the, the the Republic of Ireland, he was also player manager of Limerick United uh, in the League of Ireland. And in early May, uh, Limerick United won the FAI Cup, uh, which would be the domestic uh, cup competition in the Republic of Ireland. They beat uh, Bohemians. Uh, from Dublin uh, in the final. And uh, on hand, as a result, would have been familiar with the League of Ireland. Uh, obviously, he would have been familiar with Limerick United players and, you know, he would have known, shall we say, the better players in the other League of Ireland clubs as well. So uh, this, you know, aided him in uh, selecting uh, the best uh, players that he possibly could uh, from League of Ireland clubs uh, to make up the numbers to go on this tour. But as you said, Shahan, uh, there was uh, an Irish League uh, tour was all so taking place uh, in New Zealand at this time. So that meant that, you know, um, may- maybe he wouldn't have been able to call up, shall we say, an all-star League of Ireland eleven. But we have to remember as well, Shahan, that League of Ireland players for the most part at this stage were part-time players. So I mean, you know, this I mean, the standard between the top level of the League of Ireland and the shall we say the top level of the English league would have been miles apart. Uh, one of the players actually that Owen Hand called up was a guy from Limerick United, uh, Johnny Walsh, uh, who who was a prominent player with Limerick United. He actually Owen Hand, kind of from a Limerick United point of view, uh, Owen Hand would have regarded him as Limerick's Johnny Giles. But I mean, it was wanting, as I said, you know, performing well and performing consistently in the League of Ireland. But, you know, uh, being called into a senior international squad, then, you know, it was about 10 steps higher up the ladder. So, I mean, you know, unless you were a really, uh, unless you were a really top level League of Ireland uh, player, uh, you know, at international level, you were going to be, you were going to be out of your debt and you were going to be found out pretty quickly. So uh, two prominent League of Ireland players anyway were called up. Uh, as I said, the aforementioned Johnny Walsh and also Mick Fairclough of Dundalk 
who was a striker of uh, some renown in the League of Ireland. And uh, both of these players uh, subsequently ended up getting their their, their first and only caps uh, on this tour. So uh, to sum up, Shahan, it, uh, the squad that he assembled was really a hodgepodge, uh, you could say, selection, uh, which, uh, you know, some, shall we say, uh, lesser known uh, English first division players and I suppose really the best that he could muster uh, from the League of Ireland in Ireland. Yes. So the first match on the tour was at Santiago versus Chile with many of the new caps you mentioned, and uh, all, as well as uh, Sean O'Driscoll, in addition to the Mike Walsh and Mick Fairclough. Yes. And, uh, and the match ended as a 1-0 win for Chile. They scored in the first minute, and they held on to the win. And uh, obviously, uh, if not for these extenuating circumstances, probably none of these players would, would have earned international caps, I assume. Yeah, that would be great, Shahan. Now, uh, before the game against Chile, uh, there was something of a, a, um, a tumultuous uh, lead-up to it because uh, the original travel arrangements uh, that the FAI had arranged for the South American tour was uh, to, to play Argentina, as we know, and then to play Chile. So the FAI stuck with their original travel arrangements, which meant a stopover in Buenos Aires en route to Santiago. Now, as I said already, half the squad had British passports and they were detained by armed Argentinian police at Buenos Aires airport for a few hours, which, you know, was quite an unsettling experience. Uh, they were eventually cleared to fly to Chile. But, I mean, this, you know, would not have... You know, if if the lead up to the to the first game of the tour was chaotic enough, uh, this unsettling uh, episode, you know, did little to you know improve uh, confidence and stability within the camp. So it was uh, they they eventually anyway arrived in Chile, but preparation, needless to say, was somewhat disrupted. Uh, I think they only had one training session. I think before the Chile game. Uh, or, or something like that, and it might not even have been a full-blown training session at that. So, I mean, taking all that into account, a 1-0 defeat to a team that was going to the World Cup and a 1-0 defeat to a first-minute goal uh, wasn't an awfully bad result. So, um, as I say, the performance, the, kind of the general performance would have been somewhat encouraging, but uh, what, has, what has made assessment of this to a more difficult is that no Irish media because of the, because of the conflict in the Falklands, no Irish media covered the tour, so information was restricted to dispatches uh, from with it, from the Irish camp itself. So uh, information that was relayed back uh, was somewhat uh, sketchy, and we have to remember as well, Shahan, of course, in the world of 1982, uh, telecommunications were far removed from what they are now. So, you know, communication uh, from one side of the world to the other could be somewhat difficult. Uh, so it was a one nil defeat anyway, as I said, uh, to Chile. And this game was also a first cap for uh, Mick Fairclough of Dundalk and Mike Walsh of Everton. Yes. And we should mention that Mike Robinson was injured during this match and he had to fly back home. So, yes, yes, and I suppose as well, Shahan. I suppose uh, a player that had just has come to mind, and another player that would have been known in the English game at this stage. Uh, he was the goalkeeper on this tour. Was Jerry Payton? Yes, yeah, I think he may have been with Fulham at this time or whatever. He subsequently went to Bournemouth, but uh, he went on this tour anyway, and uh, and uh, he 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 played in all the games. Yes. So now let's discuss. Uh, Ahead of uh, the match against Brazil, there was a threat of a mutiny by the players uh, because of uh, some unpaid bonuses. What can you say about that? 
Yeah. Well, as I said, uh, the FAI were promised uh, the original plan was that uh, they would receive 50,000 Irish punts uh, for taking part in this tour. And some of that money, needless to say, would have been uh, uh, going to the players as regards bonuses. Now, there was a small upfront payment made uh, to each player that went on the tour at the outset uh, of, the, of, of the tour. Um, and there was supposed to be more uh, appearance money uh, coming to the players as the tour went on. But obviously, after the Chile game anyway, uh, there was no appearance money uh, for, for that game forthcoming. So uh, some of the players were not happy about this. And then the fact that, you know, the the, the arrangements were a, sh were a shambles and that, you, you know, they were sort of, the team was sort of being sent from pillar to post almost and, you know, having to go backwards and forwards across South America maybe, you know, when, when maybe travel uh, wasn't as salubrious as it is nowadays. You know that would have uh, uh, contributed to the a feeling of discontent. So uh, the players, anyway, uh, by uh, prior to the Brazil game, the player the players sought uh, their their unpaid bonus money by this stage, and as you say, they uh, raised the possibility of a mutiny. So to sum up, anyway, it re it, re it required a lot of diplomatic skills from own hand towards his superiors in the FAI to iron out this problem. Yes. But again, again, this would have, you know, done very little to inspire confidence in the, in the camp, uh, particularly in regard to their next game, which of course was going to be the monumental game of the tour uh, against Brazil. Yes. And I mean, widely, widely acknowledged Shahan as possibly the greatest team never to win a World Cup. Indeed. Yes. Mm. This man, this, this second match on the tour on May 27th, the Irish were soundly defeated 7 0 by the Brazil of Zico and Socrates and Falcao, and we can all name the rest of the team. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it was a it was a match where they held on 1 0 for the first half, but they completely were overrun in the second half. And they were especially vulnerable in the dead ball situations. I think like four of the goals came off of corner kicks, if I seem to remember. And one of them was like from a free kick. The first one was off of a free kick. But uh, yeah, can you describe uh, the performance and the aftermath? Yeah. yeah. Well, the original plan was, Shahan, that this game would be played in the American air. And as I said already, uh, this particularly appealed to Liam Brady. Uh, I think it's fair to say that this was the main reason why he went on this uh, South American tour, uh, you know, the prospect of uh, playing Brazil in the American Air Stadium. But uh, for some reason, uh, a few d or, or, or shortly uh, before this game on the 27th of May, the game was switched to Uberlandia, which I, I think was somewhere in the region of 600 miles uh, further north of Rio de Janeiro. And uh, the, the 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 Irish team anyway when they flew into Rio de Janeiro they then had to take another flight to Uberlandia, and Uberlandia was really uh you know from from accounts of the place anyway it's it seems to be something of an outpost uh in other words um a kind of uh, a small enough stadium uh kind of I suppose you know kind of in, in one of the poorer uh, uh regions of Brazil um. And the story is going to that um, you know, a lot of the of the natives of the Uberlandia region were quite poor, and it was said that some of them actually uh, spent their life savings on obtaining tickets for this game because it was possibly their only chance of seeing their Brazilian national team play in Uberlandia. So, uh, does um, Mike Walsh anyway said years later that. When the Irish team arrived on the pitch in and uh, they couldn't have um, a pre-match warm-up because the, the 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 pitch seemed to be completely covered in you know television cables and telephone cables and so on. So the the pitch was eventually cleared of these cables, and when the Irish players went out for a belated warm-up, uh, they, they 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 found the stadium which was which was small enough by international standards, but they found the stadium absolutely packed to the rafters, and it was absolutely rocking. The, the atmosphere was absolutely rocking because, uh, you, you know, a lot of Brazilians present 
you know, would have been from the Uberlandia region. Uh, you know, um, as far as I know, Shahan, this could have been the only game that Brazil ever played there. So, let us say, it was going to be a once-in-a-lifetime event. So, as many of the natives uh, were anxious, uh, if at all possible, you know, to get to this game, to see Brazil in action, particularly this great Brazil team, which was widely touted at the time as, you know, you, you know, being favourites for the World Cup. So, um, yeah, the game, the game, the game anyway itself, uh, Brazil, of course, played their stars to the team, uh, as you would expect. Uh, the halftime score was 1-0 which, you know, would indicate that uh, Ireland were, do were doing OK. But as you say, in the second half, the floodgates opened. I suppose maybe because of the fact that the Irish were under strength, maybe they gave it their all in the first 45 minutes and in the second 45 just maybe ran out of steam. And, uh, you, you know, a team with the quality of Brazil were able to uh, exploit that. And uh, Johnny Walsh of Limerick United, he was a substitute uh, for this game against Brazil. And he, he recalled afterwards that with about 10 minutes to go, uh, the score was 6-0. And Johnny was actually praying. He was looking at own hand and he was he was praying in his own mind that own hand would send him on uh, for the final few minutes of this game. Uh, just so that Johnny could say that he played against Brazil. Even though the score at this stage was 6-0 and... You know, you know, a lot of players wouldn't be anxious to uh, get on the field for uh, the conclusion of a game such as this. But uh, he he was hoping anyway that he, he that own hand would give him the call to go on as a substitute, so that Johnny could always say he played against Brazil. Now this didn't happen, and towards the end of the game, Seco added a seventh goal. So um, yeah, it it was Ireland's record defeat. Uh, it still is the record defeat uh, to this day. Uh, a 7 0 defeat to Brazil. And of course, uh, what added insult to injury then was that, uh, you know, f uh, the Irish players were feeling dejected enough after the game. But uh, to compound it all, then uh, they had to share their flight back to Rio with the victorious Brazilian team. Mm -hmm. And the Brazilians, needless to say, were in party mode. Uh, they were at, they, they were in one they were sort of in one half of the plane. The Irish players dejected were in the other half, so they could only just watch and observe and listen to uh, the Brazilian festivities, which were in full swing uh, at this stage. So you, you, you know, suffering a humbling defeat was bad enough, but then having to endure the 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 celebrations of the of the victorious team was you, you know harder to take again. So. Uh, so bef so after this uh, the loss against Brazil, Liam Brady was was said to be inconsolable and in tears, and uh, in fact uh, he wanted to return home. Is is that true? That's right, yeah, that's right. Because I mean, you know, he had sacrificed, you know, kind of a lot. I mean, you know, kind of he had put. You, you know, his personal life on hold at this stage because, as I already said, he had to start out his club career for the upcoming season in Italy. Uh, his wife was expecting a baby and I think it was also their... I think it was also actually their wedding anniversary around this time. So he, you know, uh, sacrificed all this to go on this tour uh, in the belief that, you know, they were going to be playing Brazil in the Maracana Stadium. Uh, what transpires turned out to be a damp squib. And, uh, you know, as... And then, you know, having to um, suffer the humiliation of captaining a team that, you know, were, were well and truly beaten 7 nil was all in all too much to take. So he wanted to um, uh, quit the tour and return to Italy there and then, but uh, he was unable to arrange uh, a flight uh, to Italy. So he ended up uh, going uh, to uh, Trinidad uh, for the final game. Now, what I should point out as well was that uh, prior to the Brazilian game, uh, the game against Ch or, or the game against uh, Peru uh, was was pulled from the itinerary, and I think there was also a game uh, against Honduras, and that was was pulled as well. Now the reasons for these games being pulled are unclear. Uh, apparently, uh, Hondu the Honduran FA said that no arrangement had been made uh, with the FAI for a game against Honduras. Uh, prior, uh, despite the FAI saying so, uh, uh, a couple of weeks previously that a game against Honduras had been lined up as a replacement for the for 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 the um, pulled Argentina game, 
and why Peru, why Peru pulled out of the Ireland game is unclear. Uh, there is anecdotal evidence, but I stress that this is, is anecdotal, so it cannot be conclusively uh, proved that, the, that Peru uh, pulled out of the Ireland game uh, in solidarity with Argentina because of the fact that Ireland, uh, through no fault of their own really, were forced to withdraw from the match against Argentina, uh, Peru pulled out of their game against Ireland in solidarity with the Argentinians. But as I say, that is anecdotal evidence and has never been uh, conclusively proven. And I think it's fair to say will never be conclusively proven at this stage. Yes. Now, the third match uh, that was arranged against Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago was on May 30th. And Ireland lost this match 2-1 to finish off this disastrous true this disastrous tour. Now, mm. there are a lot of stories uh, about this match and uh, and the events surrounding it. Uh, can you discuss some of them? Yeah. Well, as I said, there are stories in the abundance about this particular game. Um Several several players who took part and on hand, the manager, are convinced to this day that, uh, that Ireland actually did beat Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, now, when Ireland got to Trinidad, they played two games. They played one game against a Trinidad uh, club team. And the second game was against the international team of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, uh, the, the players in question and on hand are adamant that Ireland lost their game to the club team, but they beat Trinidad and Tobago uh, um, uh, 2-1, I think it was. But there was no uh, media present uh, to cover uh, the the Trinidad and Tobago League of the Irish Tour. Uh, I believe there was even no media from Trinidad and Tobago present. So, uh, and... um, it was just left to the Trinidad FA to, you know, make the results of the games public. So it was said anyway that the Trinidad and Tobago FA switched the results of the games. In other words, they uh, uh, made it known that Ireland had actually beaten their, uh, the Trinidad club team, but had lost the, what was uh, regarded as the full international game uh, against Trinidad and Tobago 2-1. So uh, that is one story from this game. Um, so, so as I say, with no media cov- covering the game, it's impossible to uh, to, to to know at this stage. Um, so, uh, Johnny Walsh of Limerick actually uh, made his debut uh, for Ireland in this game, and he tells actually a quite amusing story uh, about the aftermath of this because apparently, in the aftermath of this game, when the caps were awarded. Uh, Johnny received a cap with with the number two inscribed on it. In other words, it seemed to Johnny that he was actually awarded two caps uh, for playing in the one game. And how this possibly could have happened was that, was that when uh, when the FAI were uh, getting the caps issued, uh, maybe maybe the the FAI officialdom thought that Trinidad and Tobago were two separate countries. So they would have believed maybe that Ireland played two matches, one against Trinidad and one against Tobago. So uh, that's that that's uh, an interesting, uh, <laughs> that's an amusing uh, side story uh, to this game against Trinidad. But as I say, nonetheless, uh, no matter what the background was, it was, you know, if, if things had, you know, been bad enough on this tour, they really reached rock bottom after, you know, after this defeat, because I mean, you know, losing to a team of, you know, part timers and, you, you know, maybe I, I mean, the st- I I don't know what the standard, what the domestic standard of football in Trinidad and Tobago was, but one thing is for certain, I mean, it would have been quite, it would have been quite low indeed, and I mean, you know, Trinidad and Tobago was still at this stage miles away from, you know, even you know, threatening to qualify for a World Cup, which they eventually did in 2006. But back in 1982, you know, they would have been worlds away from even contemplating, you know, uh, being good enough to take part in a World Cup. So uh, it was a 2-1 defeat anyway, or so we're told. So 
Um, on hand, actually, as I said, was adamant that the results were switched. But as he said afterwards, I mean, when he got back to Dublin, there was little point in, you know, uh, make, you know arguing this point with, mm. with with the Irish media that they had lost to, to, to Trinidad because he said three days earlier, they just lost 7 nil to Brazil. Yeah. So if that wasn't humiliating enough, I mean, he said, what was going to be claimed, claimed from saying to the media, you know, hey, we beat Trinidad and Tobago. So... In closing, what did this tour do for the reputation of the FAI and how is this tour regarded in Irish football folklore? Well, in Irish football folklore, um, it, nowadays it's looked back, you know, kind of with some amusement. Um, even though it wasn't amusing at the time, it was really regarded as the lowest point of um, Irish international football. And I suppose it remained the lowest point up until 1995, uh, when under Jack Charlton, Ireland could only draw against Liechtenstein in, in a European Championship qualifier. So that sort of superseded uh, this tour uh, as being the low point of Irish international football. But as I say, up, up to then anyway, uh, this 1982 tour would have been the low point uh, because of the symbolic nature of the um, of the tour. Um, what promised, you know, kind of what promised at the outset to be a dream tour of South America playing against, you know, the top nations uh, on that continent really turned out to be uh, nothing short of a farce. So, uh, so it, all in all, it was regarded as uh, the ultimate low point up to then anyway of uh, Irish international football. Now, it was never made public how much money the FAI subsequently made uh, from this tour. But Pedro Driscoll, as subsequently declared the tour a success. Now, whether he was just trying to cover over the cracks, you know, or whether the FAI did receive, you know, most, uh, if not all, of the £50,000 they were um, promised, uh, we'll never know at this stage. But um, the tour itself then was the pinnacle, as I said, uh, for the careers of Johnny Walsh of Limerick and Mick Fairclough of Dundalk, who both won their first caps. Uh, Mike Walsh, of course, well, of course, Sean O'Driscoll too. Uh, he won. A, uh, um, uh, he he played for London this tour, but he never played for Ireland again. Um, Mike Walsh of Everton actually he played in all three games on this tour, and he he subsequently played uh, the following October in a European Championship qualifier against Iceland, but. And uh, he subsequently never played for Ireland again after this. So for several of the players, you know, it it, it would have been kind of their only uh, time that they represented Ireland or, or the Republic of Ireland. So it would have been the pinnacle for, the, for at international level anyway for the careers of a lot of these players. Uh, in in general, it's it goes without saying that the FBI were shambles uh, at this stage because as we can see, I mean, their organisation of the tour and then, you know, refusing to uh, alter their their original travel arrangements, which which means um, uh, the Irish team had to stop off in Buenos Aires en route to Chile and the fact that half the team, uh, those with British passports, were subsequently detained by armed Argentinian police in Buenos Aires for a few hours, you know, did little to, um, you know... I suppose eight preparations for the game, uh, for, for the game against Chile, and also you know improved morale within the camp, and of course the issue, as you said, Shahan, of you know unpaid bonuses, which took uh, a lot of diplomacy uh, from one hand to iron out this problem. But uh, for many years, anyway, uh, Liam Brady in particular, you know, kind of. Uh, you, you know, he took this tour pretty badly, and indeed, it is only in recent years that. You know, the likes of Liam Brady and Owen Hand uh, are now or can now look back on this tour, you know, with um with with some degree of amusement. Um because uh, as Liam Brady said, you know, kind of uh, you know, they 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 got to know uh, several of the top League of Ireland players uh, who went on this tour. So I suppose all in all anyway, I suppose people, you know, can, even though it wasn't amusing at the time, people can look back on it now on this tour, you know, with some degree of amusement. But all that, sum up, Shahan, anyway, it was uh, the tour was a shambles from start to finish and did absolutely nothing to, um, you know, enhance the standing or the reputation of the FAI uh, at international level. Yes. With that, I'd like to thank you for this interview. 
uh, I want to remind everyone to please read the main blog article as well for more detail. Uh, the link is included on the video upload description along with our respective contact information. So thank you again and hope to have more discussions in the future. Absolutely, Shan, and thank you very much once again. And, you know, always a, always a pleasure and a privilege, you know, to uh, enjoy your podcasts. And, of course, when Paul is on board as well, you see, and uh, they've often, you know, passed uh, a Monday afternoon for me or a Sunday afternoon at that stage. So long may they continue. And, of course, you know, kind of looking forward as well to doing the next installment of the, of the Republic of Ireland in the 87-88 season. Of course, indeed. Yeah. Happier times, of course, for the Republic of Ireland by then, but... Of course. Of course. <laughs> That's the story for another day. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. No, no problem. A pleasure as always, Jahan. Take care. Thank you. Okay, no problem.